The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, your divine wisdom sets in order all things in heaven and on earth. Put away from us all things hurtful and give us those things that are beneficial for us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Welcome to another podcast on Hebrews. This is for proper 24b. It's Hebrews 4, 1 to 13, and you could also add verses 14 to 17. Uh, those were passages that we uh, did an exegesis of on Good Friday. So you could go back to that and look at what we said about that there. I'm going to briefly reflect on it here, but I'm going to spend most of my time um, talking about the first 13 verses and especially about the Sabbath rest. The gospel lesson from Mark is a continuation of the sort of the conclusion of what happens after the rich young man. So those two lessons from last week, Hebrews 3 and Mark um, 10, and Hebrews 4 and the continuation of that passage from Mark 10 go together quite nicely. Um, I highly encourage you to read John Kleinig's commentary. He always has a wonderful little section, and I just finished reading it before coming over here to record this. Uh, this, would, this would be on page 221 and following, where he says reception and application, and he talks about the use of this text as proper 24 in series B, and it's really relationship to the divine service and the Sabbath rest. What I'm going to do is just point out some things here that I think will help you kind of get into the text a little bit, some themes that come through. Um, moving over to the text now, I, I think it's very important to see that what we have here is a text that is really focused on the Sabbath rest. And John Kleinig talks this a foretaste of the eternal rest. And um, if, you, if you look at it here, you can see that the Sabbath rest here is from this quotation from, from, um, from uh, Psalm 95. And, and really, you see it, it's going to be a continuing um, enter, into, sorry, enter into the rest. Now, I put this in purple because it's sort of a, a, a place where it says they are not going to enter into the rest, you know. They're prevented from entering into the rest. But the, 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 the key to this passage really is the, the, the language here I have in, in the yellow where you have the sabbatismos for the people of God. And I think that's, that's where we want to put our focus on this text. And it all sort of leads to this. And what does this mean? And this is where Kleinig is so incredibly valuable in terms of being able to help us through this. Um, there, there are just a number of incredible passages here that really kind of lead us to see how this Sabbath rest is centered in the atonement of Jesus. And so let's, let's just begin to walk through it very, very, very quickly here. Um, please notice that we, we have this language here of, therefore, let us fear, okay, that hortatory subjunctive, lest, you know, uh, none of you, as long as the promise of entering into this, this rest still sort of abides, that you should come to it too late. You should come to it at a later time. Um, and now he talks about the preaching of the gospel and the word of hearing. Here, here you can see that what he's talking about very clearly is what happens in the divine service, that this is where we hear the gospel preached and that we are to, to, to listen to it in such a way that we might therefore enter into that Sabbath rest. Literally, verse 2, and, and I'm going to read you the, the Kleinig uh, translation because he really, it sparkles. For we too have had the gospel preached, 
just as they have. And we're just talking about the people in the wilderness and, of course, those who then hear Psalm 95. We're all in the same boat of not entering this rest if we don't hear the word of God, hear the gospel. But the word that was heard did not benefit them. Did not benefit them. Why? Since it was not blended with faith for the hearers. Now, here you can see a, a fundamental principle of the New Testament and certainly a continuation of the old, that when the word of God is preached, we hear it with faith. We hear it in faith. And again, as we've seen all along, the Israelites are the example of what not to be, that we are not to follow in that example. And so he continues here in verse 3, for we believers, we believers are entering into the rest, and we are, just as he has said, just as he has said, as I swore in my oath, in my oath, excuse me, um, and the, the, this is hard, always hard to translate. Kleinig translates it this way, even, uh, excuse me, they shall not enter into my place of rest. He just ignores it, okay? And th this, is, this is where we're going to see the atonement here at the very end of three, where it says, even though his works were finished, his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now, what are those works that he finished? Of course, it is the atonement. The works are the atonement. And you can see the movement here that the good news that is preached is that his works were finished from the foundation of the world. And I think there you can see the movement with faith here grasping that reality as the wonderful movement of what happens when we come together in faith to hear the, 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 good, the good news. Now, there, there is a, a, little, a little movement here. I'm going to probably erase this by doing this, but that's okay. That you move here to verse 4 to the creation on the seventh day. And, and look at what verse 4 says. And in, this is all part of the what went before. So you can see that you're going here from the atonement to now the, the, the language of, of creation um, where he says here in verse 4, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Now that's obviously the works of creation. And here the works from the foundation of the world, I think, is the work of the new creation. And because God created the world in the seventh day, this is really the eighth day. You know, in a sense, uh, if you include in the new creation, not just the atonement, but the resurrection. Um, you can see that the Sabbath rest to which we are all going towards, the, what we yearn for, this foretaste that we have now in our liturgy of this eternal rest, that this all comes to a head in this notion of the sabbatismos that is set apart for the people of God. And um, it, it is interesting here that he concludes this first section uh, with a return to that notion of what it is that happened with Israel. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter into my place of rest. Um, now, isn't that interesting that he comes back to this place? Um, and and, I, I, and I, I, I think I misspoke myself, that this should be understood as a negative. They shall not enter into my place of rest. And we shall, you know, God rested and he prepared this place of rest for us. But because of their faithlessness, their, their unbelief, they shall not enter into that rest. Okay, that, that's really the first part of this text. 
Um, the second part of this text starts in verse 6, um, where he says, since there is left for some to enter it, okay, and, and I think he's speaking now about the Hebrews and he's speaking about us, um, and those who formerly had the good news preached to them, so He's seeing this as being something that was good news. They did not enter it on account of their unbelief. Now, this is one of the reasons why we have this, this pericope, because you end here with unbelief. So you have unbelief as being the frame between 6 and 11. So you can see how that works. That's why they didn't enter their rest. But then he goes on and he talks about there's been a point in another day, today. You know, as if David was speaking of a, a, another time, you know, after or after a, a long time. Just as it has been written today, here's Psalm 95 again. If you hear his voice, and you do, there's the hearing there's, the, there's your liturgy. Do not harden your hearts. And then he uses the language here, Jesus, but it's really a reference to Joshua. Okay? For if Joshua had given them rest, kate pausen, there would not be, what, how, how would you translate this? There would not be another um, day, another time spoken of after these days, other days after these days. Um, now, now, this is the setup. In other words, he, here's the Israelites. It talks about the, the, the entering into the rest. And, and if he was able to rest them, then there wouldn't be another one. And, of course, the, the one who comes to give them their rest is Jesus. And then this is where, the, probably the, the center of this text, verse 9, so then, you know, a sabbatismos, Kleinig translates that a Sabbath celebration is left for the people of God. And I think you have to take this as a now, not yet, sabbatismos. And this is where Kleinig's wonderful little excursus at the end in the context of the... Um, of the, uh, the lectionary and, and how to understand this in connection with the divine service. Here, here you have the liturgy where we have that Sabbath rest. And one of the main reasons we go to the liturgy is to experience that rest, to have that rest in ourselves from being in the presence of God. And of course, the not yet, of course, points to the parousia, where we will come you know, into the full Sabbath rest that God has prepared for the people of God. So there, there is sort of a climax here by, by coming to the Sabbath rest. And then you can see 10 and 11 sort of continues this theme here that we have of the Sabbath rest, where he says, uh, let me bring that down a little bit so we can get all of that. Oops, wrong, wrong way. Got a little break in the page there. Good, that should do it. Um, you can see here in this, in this second uh, really part here, 10 and 11, I shouldn't call it a second part. Um, look, at, look at what it says. For whoever, whoever enters uh, his place of rest himself also rests from his own works like God rested from his. Um, now, this, this notion of resting from one's own works is a really curious thing, and I commend Kleinig to you on this. He's very good on this. Um, God resting from his work, obviously, is the work of atonement. And I think the way in which, in a sense, we rest from our works in the way God rests from his works, is by, is by resting in God, by resting in the sabbatismos, 
that he has prepared for the people of God. And so that's why the author in verse 11 ends with an exhortation. And I, and I think this is part of the, the previous thing. Kleinig makes a, puts a break here. And maybe, excuse me, here after 10. But I think this continues because of the language of unfaithfulness. Let us therefore be eager, spudasmo, spudasomen, let us be eager to enter into that final rest so that no one may fall by the same example of, tempt, of uh, unfaithfulness. And the reason why I think, you know, you can see that our works to enter that rest is how do we, how do we, how do we eagerly enter into that rest? By resting in him every eighth day, every Sunday at the, at the supper. I mean, that's, that should be why our people go to the supper, to find rest, to come home and be with God. Um, one of the reasons why we can do that is because of the next section here. And I, I am going to include just 14 in here because I want you to see that the word of God here is, in fact, this high priest, Jesus, the Son of God. I think there's a, a nice little frame right there. And obviously, the word and the word here, the word of God. And here, he's describing the character of the word and you know this passage so well. It's living, effective, sharper than a two-edged knife, penetrating even to the division of soul and spirit, the joints as well as the, the marrow, able to judge the fantasies and intentions of the heart. And no creature is invisible in his sight, but all things are naked and helpless to the eyes of him who is our word, to him who is our word. Now, th this, is, this, is a, this is a Christological section. This is talking about Christ as the viva vox Jesu, as the living, effective word that, you know, that is like the sword that pierces Mary's soul from Luke chapter 2. The sword that pierces Mary as the personification of Israel. And here it is, you know, a sharp knife sharp sword, I guess you could call it, in, in the two different places, in Luke and here in Hebrews. One of the reasons why some people think Luke had a hand in Hebrews. And the, the reason why this, this word here is effective is because he is the great high priest. Now, Van Oya puts this as the conclusion in what he calls the inclusion of this section. And I, I'm very, very much attracted to that. Um, I think, I think it does sort of form a, a hinge between 13 and 15, you know. The, and, and you can see there's a change here. Therefore, having so great a high priest who has gone through the heavenly places, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to that confession. And why do we want to hold fast to that confession? So that we might inherit... Whoops. This sabbatismo that has been prepared for the people of God. Okay, um, this is a, a beautiful text. It's a complex text. If you preach on this text, there is a lot here. That's one of the reasons why you probably don't want to include, you know, 14 to 16, except maybe with a reference there to Jesus the high priest as being that word that's living. And if you think about this in terms of the rich young man and the, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, uh, you, you can see that in order to enter that rest, we need to be able to understand fully how Christ became humiliated, humble on behalf of us, uh, and, that, and that what it is that gives us access to that Sabbath rest for the people of God is, is hearing and believing that word of proclamation that the works that were set from the foundation of the world to redeem the world, to recreate it and make it new. That, that that comes from that living voice of Jesus, that living word that really does penetrate the very essence of us. 
and prepares us to spend an eternal rest with the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.